Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, here in the John Hope Franklin Center. I imagine I don't have to really introduce my guest, Mark Lamont Hill. And, and where do I begin in talking about what the hell it is that you do? <laughs> Too many jobs. Morehouse man. professor, CNN contributor, host of VH1 Live. At, did I miss anything? Nah. Regular contributor, author, most specifically the author of the brand new book, Nobody. Casualties of America's War on the Vulnerable from Ferguson to Flint. Previous books include The Classroom in the Cell, Conversations on Black Life in America, which was written with Mumia Abu-Jamal. And his very first book, Beats, Rhymes, and Classroom Life, Hip-Hop Pedagogy and the Politics of Identity. How you doing, Mark? I am good, man. It's good to see you. Man, thanks for joining us here in Durham. I know you've been on the show a few times, but the first time you've been able to bless the studio. I so, know. I, was like, I, call, I called through. you somewhere. I said, I'm going to come down here <laughs> and do this, man. I want to do it. Because I saw the new studio, you know, last time I was here, we were Skyping. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I want to be in the studio and do it. So talk about this new book. Um, you know, we're at a really different moment, you know, with black fiction. You know, Ta-Nehisi Coates has changed the game. Right? Yes. Now, now, everybody wants a nonfiction book from a black male thinker. Talk about how you thought about putting this book out here, right? Because, you know, it, it's like one of those, like, surprise books. <laughs> you know, because right. academics, we're always talking about, well, I'm working on this book. And I'm where it's like, we wake up one day and, like, Mark Lamont Hill has a new book, right? right? right. <laughs> well, it, it's one of those things that I wasn't working on this book at all, obviously. Yeah. Um, I was working on uh, a project. Actually, when I was at Hip Hop Literacy, I was yeah. writing about literacy and doing a literacy memoir and thinking about some things in my field. And I was beginning my field work in Palestine on Afro-Palestinians. And then BET sent me down to, uh, to Ferguson yeah. to cover the death of Mike Brown on April, August, excuse me, August 9th, uh, 2014. And I got there on August 10th and I was struck by what I saw. Yeah. And I was so profoundly moved uh, by not just the death of Michael Brown, but the community response to the death yeah. of Michael Brown, that I said, I have to tell this story. And you know how book deals go. You know, you yeah. go in, you write, it, you write up a, con a proposal, you know, I, I brought it in there, and they were like, we're on it. We, they gave me a deal, they were excited about it. <laughs> we want this. We want this, right? <laughs> and, and the two things that were striking, one, to your point about ta was they absolutely said that at a, after the success of, of ta and not just between the world and me, but even his pieces in the Atlantic. Right. That right. there was a, a, a new space. It was almost like they realized that black people think, think <laughs> right. and will read people. And will read people. <laughs> it's like that waiting to exhale moment in the movie theater, yeah. that, you know, yeah. or you know, where it's like, oh, or the book for that matter. It was like, yeah. oh, wait, we can write some nonfiction. Fiction, right. Or right. after oh. Love, Love Jones, like, oh, or Boys in the Hood, right? There's, right. These, mo there's these different kind of genres right. that are open again. They re re reminded them of who we were. And so they were like, yeah, write your book. So I write the book, and the book was initially just Mike Brown. Ferguson and the politics of disposability. And uh, before I could even finish the proposal or the first introductory chapter, I went back to Ferguson and I was standing there when the verdict came back or the, the, they weren't going to, or the decision to not indict uh, uh, Darren Wilson. And I watched that city turn upside down and I was struck by that as well. But then Eric Garner. Right. You know, he had been killed already, but Daniel Pantaleo was not indicted right. that winter. And then, and so I was like, you know what, maybe I should m mention this too. Then it was like Baltimore, by the time April came, I was like, wait, right. Baltimore. And then Flint. I, I mean, yeah. it, it's an interesting thing about this moment because we're all trying to capture the essence of these moments. But every day we wake up, there's a new moment, there's right? New I'm moment. thinking about all those folks who wanted to write Trayvon books. And, and before they could, the ink is dry, right. you know, Ferguson has captured our imagination. And then it's Baltimore that's captured our imagination. It, it's such a shifting terrain that it, it does raise some difficulties about how we talk about these things. That's exactly right. And that's why, at some point, I decided I'm not going to give a, a history of Ferguson or an analysis of Ferguson. One, because between cable news and social media, we kind of know what happened. Right. And right. I didn't want to just kind of do a drive-by yeah, analysis right. to get to make some money. Because I could have written it in time for the one-year anniversary if I just covered right. Ferguson right. And, and probably made a bestseller and made a bunch of money. But that wasn't my interest. As, yeah. an, as an intellectual or just as a principal person, that isn't the story I wanted to tell. I wanted to tell a story that would have some legs. I thought to Michael Eric Dyson's book about Katrina, for yeah. example, right. uh, you know, that's still being read right now. Right. Because it wasn't just about the immediate right, moment. Right, so before and, and, and speculating about the afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so as the story's expanded, I said, you know, this is really a story about state violence on multiple levels. 
And that's why it became Ferguson, initially Ferguson to Baltimore and beyond. Because I was trying to tell the story of from Ferguson to Baltimore, but I also anticipated yeah, right. that there'll be more. There'll be more. And the publishing houses, quite cynically, every house I went to, quite cynically, said, We feel comfortable with you publishing this book because another black person will be killed by the time the book comes out. Right. So that and sure enough, the, the the month my book came out, in fact they moved the publication date up because Philando Castillo not Philando Castillo, because um Alton Sterling, Sterling right. had been killed. Then Philando Castillo was killed right after. And once again, it was it was just, it was relevant. Yeah. But then Flint happened, and I said, you know, the story of state violence can't be reducible to police shooting us. Right. There's other aspects of it. Right. There's other right. aspects of it. The sort of ordinary, the quotidian aspects of social. State and, and Flint wasn't sexy, right? And the way that the police right. shootings are sexy, Flint wasn't sexy, right? It was something that folks had to go in and get their hands dirty. Exactly. To both figure out what was happening, but also think about responses to it. That's yeah. exactly right. And so when I decided to add Flint, not just to the book, but to the title, yeah. I thought it would be a more robust analysis that would actually be more reflective of what the whole book's about. Because yeah. as sexy as the police shooting or the racist cop, the foaming at the mouth racist cop is, there's also an interesting story of Ferguson about job flight. Right. about the, the, the collapse of public housing. Neglect. Neglect. Right. Neglect. Right. You know, all of these are forms of, of violence on some level, and I wanted to tell that story too, yeah. but I knew people aren't going to just buy a book about state violence um, in the ordinary sense. They need the, the shootings. They need the killings. And they need right. to understand what that means too. And so I try to tell the story of our history, of where we're going, of the activism surrounding it, and about the structural issues that kind of overdetermine people's possibilities. One of the things that's interesting, you mentioned being in Ferguson, right? And, and it was an interesting moment because there were so many folks, journalists, black academics that were embedded in Ferguson. Yes. And I think back to the Watts Wides in the 60s, and, and one of the things that came out of Watts is that when they needed to, folks to go in and cover Watts, all these newspapers figured out that they didn't have any black reporters. <laughs> and, and none right. of their white reporters would go into Watts, would go into Detroit two years later, would go into Newark two years later. So they end up hiring folks you know, uh, black folks onto the press corps simply so they could have a better way to cover, you know, what was happening. I, it feels like there was an element of that with absolutely with Ferguson also in particular, and then later Baltimore. And, and what struck me about it was like the level and the skill set of folks that were going in. Like, mm -hmm. so you got folks like Jelani. Yep. You know, who's just strictly killing the game at the New Yorker absolutely. at the moment. You're there. You got folks like Melissa taking her show there. Um, you have on the ground, you know, regular, or not regular, but, you know, working journalists like Yami Sendor, who's there on a regular basis. Um, what was it like as a community of folks who knew each other, who were aware of each other, that are there on the ground in Ferguson covering it this? Was, it was amazing in many ways, partly because usually when, as a, as a I guess I have to say I'm a journalist now too. <laughs> and I guess I've always resisted that title, like I'm an academic who just right. won't be on well, TV well, sometimes. <laughs> but, but you know, as a BET News host, I actually anchor and develop stories, I write stories. And so I got down there, and usually when I get sent places, whether it's Nelson Mandela's funeral, whether it's here, right. um, I'm alone. Um, <coughs> when I got down there, this was the first time that I felt a sense of community among journalists and among folk. Yeah. And five years ago, it just wouldn't have happened that way. Right. So I get down there and CNN and sent all the black folks. Sonny Hostin was down there. Uh, Don Lemon was down there. I mean, they were like, we don't even care what your political persuasion is <laughs> if you're down there. And, and you see this. It happens with NBC. Like, they'll send Al Roker to something. Right? Right. Al Roker's right. the weather dude, but like, when some shit, when some shit pop off, they're like, send Al, because at least we know he's black. So it was good to have community down there. And it was good for us to engage both on the intellectual side and the personal side. So right. I, could, I could chill with Jelani and Kathy's and eat some peach pie, right. but then we could also strategize about how we're going to talk about yeah. the release of this information, because we knew an indictment or non-indictment was going to come when we went back that November, mm -hmm. that week before Thanksgiving. And so thinking about it in that way was really helpful. Um, it's also interesting um, how not only did the media outlets lean on the hires that they had and, and kind of expand the roles of people who, who are already working there, but they also began to lean into new media in a different yeah. way. Right. The first thing I saw when I got down to Ferguson, I went down to the Quick Trip, and there was a parking lot full of bloggers and activists, people who I knew right. purely from Twitter, Facebook, right. And, right. and Instagram, and stenciled on the ground in, in really interesting pastel colors was, thank you, black Twitter. Hmm. And I was so struck by that. And as I talked to folk, and I talked to Netta, who I believe wrote it, they were saying that this story only got told right. because right. a new generation of folk decided that they weren't going to wait for mainstream right. media to get the black guy to tell the story. They weren't going to wait 
for their Bernard Shaw. They weren't going to wait for, you, you know what I mean? They said, we're going to, um, we're going to tell the story the way we want to tell it and force the media to catch up. And, and that was really how I think the attention came to Fergie. Mike Brown's body was out there for four and a half hours. Right. I saw it on Instagram. We're about Twitter, right? Yeah, we're on Twitter. We don't right. see that. Snapchat and right. Yeah, you don't see that stuff. And it was also, I think, um, an opportunity to counter narrate it. The first uh, night I was out there, I went down there to shoot um, some B roll footage and do some interviews just for myself. And they said there's a midnight curfew. Mm -hmm. So I got down there at like 12 15. I was like, I don't care about the curfew. I'm going to see who's out here. They had tanks moving in, they had guns pointed at us. And there were maybe 200, 300 people out there, maybe 500 people at, at, at midnight. About 2 o'clock, the numbers dwindled, but there yeah. were still a couple hundred people. We were resisting the, the curfew. The curfew. Yeah. Yeah. And they sent tear gas. They said, if you don't leave, we're going to be forced to arrest you. They then shot tear gas at us. They sent smoke first, and, about, and kids were throwing them back. Five minutes later, they sent tear mm -hmm. gas. But they didn't say they were sending tear gas. They said, we're going to send more smoke, and you need to go. So I'm tweeting, yo, just got tear gassed, right? I'm with Kiki Palmer, of all people, right? Who, who was like, I'm not going nowhere. Kiki's like, I ain't going. Kiki was riding. She's like, I'm not going nowhere. I didn't expect that to be a, <laughs> radical, a moment of radical politics with Kiki. But, but Kiki's like my little sister, man. She went out there, and she was like, yo, we, if I got to go to jail, I'm going to jail. Yeah. I was like, Kiki, I've been to jail before for this. This, ain't, this might not be the moment. Let's, let's shoot the special so people can actually see what happened. But she was committed to doing that. And the tear gas came, and she couldn't see. The kid next to us got shot, right? We, 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 we put pressure on the wound. We got him in the car. We got him out. I'm tweeting this stuff, right? And people are writing back to me, that ain't true. That ain't tear gas. That's smoke. I know it's smoke because I just saw that on MSNBC, Fox News and CNN. They all saying smoke. And I'm like, no, trust me. I've been tear gassed many a time. Right. This is tear right. gas. We can't breathe. We can't see. Right. But the mainstream media was painting the police as offering these gentle warnings to get protesters to leave. And that's not what they were doing. And people were getting shot with rubber bullets. People got shot with a real bullet. The guy we treated got shot with a real gun. Um, and we couldn't breathe. But only because we could tell that story yeah. and counter narrate it could that happen. And on occasion, I got to sneak on CNN and say, yo, they shooting or yo, this tear gas. But a lot of it happened through Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Um, and it was important to me for our voices to be there, not just in the mainstream outlets. I think the mainstream outlets were scrambling to catch up to us. After a while, they started going to people's Instagram pages right. and going to DeRay's Twitter feed and going to Netta's Twitter feed and going to so-and-so's page to find out what the news was. Yeah. And, and I think that's an important development in digital technology and how stories get to, in digital journalism right. and also right. in activism. Right, right. Yeah. We're also at this moment now where Everybody in America knows who Colin Kaepernick is. Yes. Um, when Colin Kaepernick first does his protest, there are folks trying to figure out how to spell his name. Right. <laughs> there are folks trying to figure out how to say his name. And I say all of that to put him in some sort of context, mm -hmm. right? He is the backup quarterback for one of the worst football teams in the NFL. It's not really about him. Right. Right. It, it, it's about what he represents at this point in time. What is it about? American empire at this stage that it's so fragile hmm. that the backup quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers could undermine its very idea of itself. Yeah, that's right? a great question. I mean, because he's, he, you know, it's, he's not Malcolm X. Right. You know, he's not Louis Farrakhan. He, he's not folks who have positioned themselves to offer very sp specific critiques of white supremacy and, and you know, folks who. Americans would think as threatening, like in a real sense. This is a dude taking a knee who's not going to take a snap. Right. <laughs> right. You know, maybe for the whole season. Right. What is it about America that he represents such a threat at this yeah, point in time? That's a, that's a great question. And, and, I, and you're right, because they could have ignored him. If, <laughs> if they'd ignored him, this would not be a right. thing at right. all, right? I think part of it is about this moment. I think part of it is about the kind of long tradition of, of the NFL and how it, it, it is an extension of American empire, right? It's an articulation of American empire, uh, more than any other pro uh, sport. Of American masculinity. Oh, absolutely, right. you know, which is tied again into this kind of imperialist impulse and this hyper, this hyper violent impulse. You, when you watch the NFL every week, they're the ones showing the soldiers, they're the ones with the flag. I mean, the NFL, the ads are always sponsored by the Army, the right. Navy, right. the Marines, right. right? You can't have an NFL game right. without just superb, Right. and extravagant displays 
of, of American patriotism and at times even jingoism. I mean, it's, yeah. it's really strong. So it was an affront to the, to the, the cultural logic of the, of the institution itself. Yeah. Yeah. Always, right? Which is why you see folks like Mike Dicker coming out and saying, you know, I have no respect for Colin Kaepernick. <laughs> Jerry Jones telling his teammates, I will cut any of you if you, if you yeah. don't. I mean, yeah. it's, it's that serious to these people. There's yeah. something about football, because it, it's seen as American sport in a different way, even right. than baseball. Although baseball, seventh inning stretch, you know what I mean? They're doing America the Beautiful, they're doing Star Spangled Banner in the first inning. It, it's, it's, it's part yeah. of our cultural ritual. It, it always has been. So I think part of it is that. Um, but I think. Um, and, and we could go even deeper in football in terms of even the language and logic of football, the right. being in the trenches, right. the right. blitzes, the, yeah. all yeah. the metaphors and language the of militarization that are in yeah. part of the it's, sport. It's right. The bomb. Right. The bomb, right. the long right. bomb. I mean, right. All of it is about the military, right? Yeah. I mean, that's just how they think about it, right? Um, and there's a long history of, of, of athletes who, when they resist in that way, unless they're really, really good, look at Craig Hodges. Right. Look at Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, right? right? We can go down a list of people who, when they resist even a little bit, yeah. like, they catch hell. I, I, you know, I'm reminded of Carlos Delgado. Mm. And, and folks forget about him, you know, playing for Toronto and, you know, the Major League Baseball dictates that after 9-11, we're going to do America the Beautiful. And he's like, not with what you're doing with Vahakis, <laughs> right. right? And he right. would sit down. And I can't right. imagine what that protest would have looked like in 2016 with Twitter and other forms of social media. Oh my God, it would have been an entirely different kind yep. of, uh, an entirely different thing. And again, it's a principal thing. He, he said, look, y'all doing military exercises in the case, and you want me to sit there and say how beautiful this thing is. Right. Colin Kaepernick said, my people dying in the street. And, and, it's, and, and it's a selfless gesture to some extent, right? Because right. he's less likely to get shot right. or arrested than anybody else in San Francisco or Oakland. Right. He could walk through the bay and be good, even right. with the police, <laughs> most of the time. But. So I actually appreciated the gesture, but to your, the bigger part of your question, which was sort of why this moment, I think there's something about Trump's America. Yeah. And whether he wins or not, this is Trump's yeah. America, because yeah. Trump's America is reflective of a certain moment, right? Where the, a, a spike in white nationalism, a, a, a growing or, or returning anxiety of the so-called other, a rising xenophobia, and a closing of ranks around America's national identity um, that is, that renders any sort of gesture of resistance to American empire yeah. to be an affront to, Ameri to, to American identity, to, uh, to American patriotism. Um, it relies on a very narrow notion of what American patriotism looks like. You know, I find Trump's candidacy so fascinating <coughs> because as someone who has been aware of Trump for the fullness of his public life, yeah. you know, growing up in New York City, oh, I've right. known this dude for 35 years. Um, and nothing about him, as problematic as he was, and, and, and you know, he was a joke. But the turn that we've seen this last year in here is not something that's been present in his public life I in the past, right? With the exception of the gender piece. Right. But what it actually does is highlight, you know, it, it almost as if it doesn't matter what he thinks, right? It's what he's put into motion. Right. Right. He tapped into, you know, something that was in the deep recess of the American psyche about how they think about race, about how they think about immigration. And he's let that shit loose. Yes. Yes. And it is, like you said, it's something that he, it, he can't control even if he wanted to at this right. point. And you could argue, you know, he's just playing this game, playing this role in order to win the presidency. But at some point, so at some point. If you're willing to rely on white supremacy to win, and you're willing to play into white supremacy's anxieties and fears and, and stereotypes and biases, et cetera, at what, point, at what point are you just not white supremacists, yeah. right? I mean, um, but I do think it's interesting to watch this happen. I think the most noteworthy thing for me, when I look at the, the demographically broken down data around polling, is that most white people are supporting Donald Trump right now, yeah. right? I mean, it's over 50%. I mean, like, they, most white people support a Democ uh, Republican candidate anyway. Right, right. right. But, but it, this, this one, one, it's right. <laughs> normally I get it, right? But right. it's like most, most white people have watched this guy for the last year and a half. Have, right. And still think and he's the no best choice to be president. Yeah. That, to me, says everything about where America is yeah. on the racial front. Yeah. Um, as does the fact that almost no black people are. Right? I mean, there are states where he's polling at zero right. percent. Right. Like, no black person. I mean, even Romney got like eight, nine percent, right? right? Even McCain got eight, nine yeah. percent, right? Yeah, Bush yeah. got 11. Yeah. You know, you would think like, <laughs> he, 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 none. 
<laughs> like, it's parts of Ohio, Pennsylvania, where not one Negro was not sure. And, and that's noteworthy, right? Yeah. And, 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 yeah. the, and the starkness of those two numbers <laughs> yeah. is, is somewhat stunning. And um, watching him play on that, I think, is important. But I, I, think it's, I think we often rely on too simplistic of an analysis of why people are doing this. For example, we always marshal out the education data and we say, right. you know, most Donald Trump supporters didn't finish college. Or, right. That is reflective of a broader set of economic issues, which I get at in nobody at right. times, particularly toward the end when I talk about Flint. It's not just that, because the simple answer is people who aren't that smart vote for Donald Trump. Right. That's the a simple answer to a very complex question, I think. I think there's some truth to that, right? I mean, right. if you're not willing to fact check things, and yeah, he's the guy right. for you, right? right. We saw the right. skit the other day where you know the, the, the Trump supporter was saying we want to we need to investigate why Obama, you know, didn't do more during 9/11, why he wasn't in, in the Oval Office or 9/11. It's like, it's well, like he wasn't president. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't. He wasn't even in the Senate. You know, like what he was able to do. But um, but so there's the piece of that people who are, are not willing to fact check. But I think there's a, another piece is that that same population that doesn't have access or didn't get access to college or didn't graduate college or go to college is also the same group of people whose jobs have been outsourced. Right. They don't have access to a living wage anymore. Right. Before they graduated high school and then they went to work for the factory and they made a living wage job and their kids went to school or their kids right. went to the factory, their kids played football. I mean, all the things that like are part of the American lore. And they're still willing to vote against the interests. And they're and willing to vote against their economic interests, right? right? Without fail. Right. <laughs> Without fail almost. But, um, uh, to vote for somebody who's closer to the bankers that needed to get bounced in 2008 than any presidential candidate they've ever had. They've ever had, right? Not just because of wealth income, but because of his actual right. job, right? He's literally, you know, like linked to these people. Right. And, but now those jobs are no longer there. Those factories have closed. They've gone to the Far East. They've gone to Latin America. They've gone to other places. So they no longer have a place in this economy. Their jobs are leaving. Um, Largely because of, of, of just the, the, the pressures of late capitalism yeah, and the neoliberal yeah. kind of impulses yeah. that, that govern certain kinds of policy choices. So, they don't, so they're like, look, I ain't got no job. I don't have a living wage. The country's changing. Mm. You add to that the Mexican, who they now see as somehow uh, incompetent for their job. job right. You know, you have post 9 11, they're looking at these sort of xenoph they're listening to these xenophobic narratives. Right. So they're saying the country's different. You got this black guy who's president. Right. Right. And so for them, it's an opportunity to make sense of the world in a way that allows them to have some sense of, of dominance still, right? Du Bois in the third chapter of Black Reconstruction talks about the psychic wages of whiteness, right? Yeah, in yeah. the chapter on the, on the, on the, um, the white worker, um, or, or even the chapter on the planter, both of those chapters, he's, he's wrestling with this question of why would the white worker align himself with the planting class and not the, the slave, right? Because as long as slaves got exists, you ain't going to have a right, living wage job. Right, right, right. But he said they, they accumulate the psychic wages of whiteness. And you watch this happen in the Trump campaign. Yeah. Now it's, yeah. But it's always been here. Right. Now you can just spot them out because right. they got these stupid ass right. hats on. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So now you know who the people, who are, people are. Who the people are. And so watching that has, has been amazing to me and watching Trump kind of poke at them and, 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 and get them. Um, at a moment where their votes are organized right. is stunning. And, and it's not different, ironically, I think, than the very Muslim or Islamist terrorists that he's pointing to, right? Because yeah. when you look at the Taliban, right. or if you go to uh, Gaza and you look at Hamas, or you go to these other places, what you see is a group of people who are economically dispossessed, um, no living wage jobs, no access to education, diminished circumstances for whatever reason. Right. And then you have an, a movement come, a radical movement, Trump, a fascist movement often, right. Trump, who comes in and says the reason for your problem is because of them. Is because of them. Right. Come with me, irrespective of what my line is. Just come with me. Trump is that person. He is the kind of American yeah. terrorist. Yeah. He's, he's following the same playbook as the very people he's scaring us of, you know, making us scared of. And so it's fascinating to watch because essentially we've seen the radicalization of, the, of, of working poor white men and women. And that's who he's become to them. Yeah. And that's why he has a damn good shot of winning. <laughs> I'm scared, man. I mean, I mean, Trump could win, and, and Hillary isn't making it easy. Easy. You've been watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We've been joined by Professor Mark Lamont Hill, Morehouse professor, contributor to BET, contributor to CNN, <laughs> host of VH1 Live. 
I like to describe him as author, scholar, public intellectual, um, mm -hmm. and, and thankfully a friend and a comrade. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Oh, it's my pleasure. Black lights and booms burn when I record for Watts And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back 